Welcome everybody and it is a great pleasure to be able to share with you some of the things the Bible is teaching in regard to the uh, third angel's message. So we just prayed together we're going to be able to go into another presentation on the third angel's message and what I'll do now is share the screen where it says this latter portion of the third angel's message. Here is the patience of the saints. We've looked at patience, we've looked at saints. Here are they that keep the commandments. And so that's what we're going to do is look at this little phrase right here, keep the commandments, in two different ways. I'm going to show you if in this program, if you were to highlight more than one word and you right-click and search for the word, whoops, I meant to do this. If you right-click and search for the word, then what's going to happen is you're going to find that phrase, not just the words. And then uh, we'll have to look at it differently as well. But this phrase, you can see it, it happens... Ten different times this phrase comes up in the Bible, keep the commandments. And it starts out in Deuteronomy, which, by the way, I don't know if you knew this, but when Jesus was in the wilderness of temptation in Matthew and Luke chapter 4, you'll find that he quoted three times when he was uh, interacting with the enemy, and he was building his foundation upon the Word of God, right? That's why he was quoting to try to counteract the words of Satan. He was trying to show that, no, 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 every man will live by the words that comes out of the mouth of God. Well, here's the thing. Every time he quoted, he quoted out of the book of Deuteronomy. I don't know if you knew that, but that's just an interesting thought for you to consider. Anyways, it goes on that uh, it says, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. Well, wait a minute. That's kind of similar to what's being said in Revelation chapter 22, right? That, here's why, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Okay, so Deuteronomy 4 is talking about keeping the commandments. What happens in Deuteronomy 5? Well, there's a recounting of the original Ten Commandments pronounced by God through his son, which was on uh, Mount Sinai. And that's why duo is two, um, nomos is words. So the second time the words were recounted, okay, and, and nomos may even be law, I don't recall, but it's uh, Deuteronomy, which is the second time the words or law was, was described. So here, we're talking about keeping the commandments, and then in the very next chapter, the Ten Commandments are highlighted. Well, right after this, the very next chapter, after the Ten Commandments were highlighted in chapter 5, it says in chapter 6, verse 7, You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, and his testimonies, and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And there are a lot of people that will say, yeah, see, keep the commandments and his statutes, that means a lot. Well, we're going to see a little bit more in the New Testament in regard to that. But uh, notice what it says in Deuteronomy 7, verse 11. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments, and the statutes, the judgments, which I command thee this day to do them. And this day, what, what do you mean this day? Well, this was only two chapters after he commanded the Ten Commandments to the uh, children, or recounted them. And then it says in chapter 8, verse 6, Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, and to fear him, fear God, and give glory to him. Right? So you could apply this to some of what we've already learned in the, the uh, third or three angels' messages found in Revelation chapter 14, 6 through 12. Deuteronomy 10, verse 13, Keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Right? And that's what it's for. God doesn't give us things that destroy us, necessarily. He gives us things for our good. Now, if we reject those things that are for our good, we will reap the rewards, and we will be destroying ourselves. But we've already also talked about the idea that God certainly does destroy. And uh, there's two parts to that that we went through. 28 verse 9, and by the way, this day, again, this was only in chapter 10, and chapter 5 is when he recounted the Ten Commandments. So, the Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee, if, oh, wait, 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 if, if, what do you mean, what do you mean, if? Well, that means that it doesn't mean he will do it necessarily, but it's a condition. The Lord will establish you as God's people. Remember that you, that word holy we looked at yesterday with the saints. Here's the patience of the saints. That word, in the New Testament anyways, is often translated holy. Well, the Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he has sworn, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. Okay, so it's not that he's going to keep you his people because he called you out of Egypt or Babylon. That's just not why you're his people. It's because you move, 
but it's because you are willing to follow him and to listen to his voice. Because listen, it's really this simple. The Mark of the Beast, Seal of God scenario is really this simple. If you want to honor the Father and His image, or the, the, you know, God and His image, you will obey Him, and then you'll be His people. If you want to worship the beast in His image, you will obey Him, the, you know, the, the devil, and then you will receive uh, His, you know, gifts, or whatever you want to call the mark, right? So, if you want to honor the Father in His image, compared to the beast in His image, you're going to worship the Father in His image by obedience, by doing that which He's commanded you. And if you do those things, then he'll make you his own holy people. And so really, it's, it's about what we want in our lives. And if we want to reflect the glory of God, as we talked about yesterday, when we were wanting to be that holy people, the saints, you know, those that really truly follow God. If we want that, he will bless us. He will make us those people. And that's what I'm looking for. I really truly do want that to be my experience. And so notice as it says here, as we continue on in Psalm 119, verse 15, or 115, sorry. Psalm 119, 115. Depart from me, ye evildoers. Okay, so if somebody is an evildoer, they are obviously in this context doing opposite of what David wants to do. They are not keeping the commandments of God. So now listen, depart from me. Is that like, you know, kind of the opposite of come out of her, my people? Right? Depart from me. Separate yourself from me, because I'm going to separate myself from you. Right? Depart from me, you evildoers, because I will do what I want to do. I want to keep the commandments of my God. And so those that are not keeping the commandments of God, oftentimes, without even realizing it, are idolaters. And we can separate ourselves from them, not because we're greater than they are, but because we want to make a point. We want to say, listen, I'm not involving myself in idolatry or pagan worship, or heathen worship, and those types of things. I want to worship the one true God. And hey, if you're willing to learn, I am more than happy to teach you. In fact, I love you enough to spend time with you patiently and work with you and teach you if you're willing to learn. If you're not, we're going to have to separate ways. I mean, that's the reality. We're going to have to do that. Christ didn't work with everybody in this world when he was here. He was here three and a half years doing ministry, and he had people that, would, that were willing to follow him. He had the disciples following him. He didn't have evangelistic meetings with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He didn't, he didn't go around like trying to proclaim various things like, hey, let's, let's just work with they, them because they do keep the Sabbath. No, 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 no. He was willing to separate from them. Now, if he had the opportunity to speak in their pulpits, if you will, he would. But many times it was to the point where he was hitting them, you know, like laying the axe to the root of the tree, right? So... And sometimes he would even do it in parables. You can see that, for example, in John chapter 6. He was preaching in, a, in the sanctuary that day, in John chapter 6. And he said something that stirred up those Pharisees and Jews and Sadducees so much that, that it actually caused some of the disciples to leave him. What happened was this. He preached to them that um, you need to eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man. And they're like, wait, what? Because you don't drink blood as a Jew. I mean, that's just as an Israelite, as a Hebrew. No, absolutely not. You didn't do that. Because that was contrary to the law of Moses, the Pentateuch, right? You didn't do that. And so for him to say that, even as an illustration, was a little bit edgy. In fact, he was very edgy. He said, listen, if you guys don't understand what I mean, let me make it clear. You don't have life in you unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man. And they're like, whoa, okay, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And some of it, even his disciples went away after that. So he was speaking parabolically in those meetings when he was there in the pulpits of those people. But he was addressing them very plainly, making it clear that unless they followed um, his words, which were the Father's words, then he was, wasn't really willing to work with them. You know, this reminds me of something that I just received this morning. I was invited to... Uh, to fellowship at a group, okay? I'm not going to tell you much because I wouldn't want them to uh, be pointed out, but um, this group of people said, you know, hey, we're hoping that you'll come join us for this specific time. And I said, oh, great. Well, hey, just so you know, I don't really take interest in those specific times, but I'm happy to speak on your behalf. Just let me know a little bit more about this. And so they said, oh, great. You know, hey, I'm going to 
you know, this is when we're doing it and etc. And so I said, well, I don't really love, you know, and I don't teach about these things in regard to what you're inviting me to be partaker of, but if uh, I can come and I'm not in support of what you're teaching, then please let me know because uh, I'll be happy to come. But I also know that it's, this is a good question to ask because sometimes there's some uh, resistance to somebody coming that doesn't believe the same. Well, that was two days ago that I asked a question. This morning I got a text saying, I revoke my request for you to come and speak to us. Thank you so much. I love your messages on this regard. And he just, you know, distanced himself from me. And I think that's what we have to do. And Jesus did that. That's what's being said right here, actually, in the uh, Ten Commandments. Uh, sorry, not the Ten Commandments, the, uh, the Psalm of David. Depart from me. Separate yourself from me because we don't do evil. We don't do those things that are contrary to God's will. Because I want to keep the commandments of my God. You see how that works? That's very similar, although in a different direction than what it says in uh, Revelation chapter 18. Come out of her, my people. Depart from me, you evildoers. Right? I'm going to separate myself because I want to keep com the commandments of my God. Now, so that was the Old Testament with this phrase, keep the commandments. And I, I could say that uh, there's a lot of ways that we can apply that especially practically. But notice in Matthew 19, verse 17, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one. And uh, that is God. And I just want you to know that this is a really powerful section. I'm actually doing a little something while I'm talking here because I want to show you this thing that I just put up this morning. This is from a book called Christ's Object Lessons. This is a really powerful book. I mean, like, really, 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 really powerful, okay? So if you haven't read this one, you should. The ruler had addressed Christ merely as an honored rabbi, not discerning in him the Son of God. Okay, the, the Son of God, right? The Savior said, well, why do you call thou me good? Why are you calling me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Now, on what ground do you call me good, the author, Sister White says. God is the one good. If you recognize me as such, you must receive me as his son and representative. Oh, that's a good one, isn't it? So that's Christ Object Lessons 390.3. And so here with this concept of um, why do you call me good? I used to teach as a Trinitarian pastor that what Jesus was doing was kind of using a play on words. It's like, wait a minute, why are you calling me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So really, why are you calling me God? Because you don't believe that I am God. That's what I used to teach, but now I fully, fully understand differently. He is asking a question without being, you know, um, how would you say, um, unclear in any way. Why are you calling me good? There is one, or none that is good, but one, that is God the Father, which is in heaven. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Which commandments are these? These are God's commandments. God the Father spoke his commandments through his Son on Mount Sinai. These are God's commandments. Now, why am I saying they're God's commandments? Well, if you go back to Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22 through 30, Proverbs 30, verse 4, you can see like uh, Abraham leading his son to the slaughter. All of this stuff that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, especially, that teaches the relationship between the father and his son. You will learn that the father brought forth his son from himself, okay? Just like Eve was brought forth from Adam. Adam and Eve are actually an illustration of the relationship between the father and his son. And uh, so w w what you find is that God was the one that was first in existence. Now, however he is, however long he's been here, I have no clue. I really, truly have no idea. The Bible doesn't speak on it as far as I know. But there was a time in eternity past, which means for us as humans, before time began on this earth. That's what eternity past is, okay? In the days of old, as it says, like in the margin of Mar Ma Micah chapter 5, verse 2, if you go back then, it was when God brought forth his son from himself. Well, who's the one that had the commandments for the son? It's the father. And when the father created all things through his son, what commands would those creatures, those beings, follow after being created by the father through the son? Well, they're following the commandments of the father. Well, after Satan fell from heaven, he was cast down to this earth. 
Well, what happens is, then people on this earth, Adam and Eve, they're supposed to keep the commandments of God, which he gave to his son and to his creation through his son. And so if you just go through this whole thing all the way to you, you recognize that this is God the Father's commandments. Now, Jesus followed the commandments of his Father, and as a result, they are his commandments as well, because he never broke them. They were his without exception. That's his son. But he was keeping his Father's commandments, and they ended up being his commandments, because he never kept anybody else's commandments. And so, yes, they're the commandments of Jesus, but let's understand, all things are from God. Amen? And so let's see right here as we continue on. The keep the commandments of who? Of God. And this is, you know, this is Jesus speaking about his Father in both accounts here. And so now we're going to jump from the uh, one time it's used in the Gospels, and then there's only two more times it's used here in Revelation. The dragon, which we know in that same chapter, verse 9, is referring to Satan. Maybe it's 7 through 9. You, you, I think it's 7 through 9. The dragon was wroth with the woman. That wroth means um, enraged, okay? this He was enraged with the woman. Now, but he doesn't make war with the woman. Oh, no. There's an interesting twist here. He went, he went, he like left because he was angry with the woman. He was enraged with her, but then he went. Where did he go? He went, obviously, from the woman, it seems. I mean, that, that's what's obvious to me anyways. He went from the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her children. Oh, wait a minute. At the very end of time, he's not making war with the woman. He's making war with her children. Like, what's the difference here? Um, hmm. Could 1980 have anything to do with this? Some of you know what I just said. Uh, so the dragon was angry with these children. And these children keep the commandments of God the Father. Okay, and we know that's God the Father. They keep the commandments of God the Father and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Oh, the testimony of Jesus Christ. And, you know, the woman used to have the testimony of Jesus Christ, but she kind of, like, left it. But the children, they do have the testimony of Jesus Christ, and they keep the commandments of God. So, I mean, like, the children are the one with the package. So that's why the dragon is angry with them. That's what I think is happening. So, 14 verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Kind of like uh, chapter 12 verse 17. This is at the end of time. And this is at the end of time. Because like right here, we already know in the three angels' messages that this is dealing with the time where you're either going to worship the Father in His image or the beast in His image. So here is the patience of the saints. Here is the endurance through trials of those that are God's completely holy. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So now this commandments of God thing, we've seen it in all the times that the phrase commandments of God is used in the Bible. We could now, at which I'm going to try to do in the next half hour, is bring the word commandments and keep together instead of keep the commandments as a phrase. I'm going to see how the New Testament, the reason why is because we don't have enough time and I don't want to do more parts on this. We, we generally understand the concept of being obedient to God's commandments. Um, and if we don't, then please let me know because I do have messages on this. I could lead you to them online and you could spend the time looking and either telling me, well, nope, you're wrong or wow, you're right. And so I need to follow the Bible because that's what I'm calling people to do is not to follow me, to follow the Bible. So if I'm wrong, I want to be corrected because I want to follow the Bible, right? And so the, the idea of, I'm going to use the word commandments or commandment because it will find commandments because I have a flex search on. So commandment and keep. I'm going to look up those words in the New Testament. I'm going to show you how I do that with this uh, program here, and hopefully it will make sense to you. So now I'm going to close this one out because we've already looked up this one phrase here by just simply highlighting in Revelation 14 verse 12 this phrase and then right-clicking and searching for the word. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to double-click this. I'm going to hit Command-D, open up a new program, tab, paste. And so I'm going to look at the word commandment or commandments. It doesn't really matter and then also the word keep. Now, because I did not select something and search for that, but I'm searching for these two words, you could go to verses or you could choose words or flex, whatever, but um, it's gonna do it automatically here in this program just because, you know, it's cool like that. But So you have the commandment and keep. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna make it bigger so that you can see, and I'm gonna come over here to this right-hand side. I'm gonna hit this little plus sign and this plus sign, if I can now go all the way over to this side, it's going to give me a range. 
Now the, you can do scope, bracket words, I'm going to not talk about that right now just because I'm going to deal with the range, but the range is all text. Well, no, I don't want all text because I just want the New Testament. Not the Old Testament, not the books of history or wisdom or the prophets, but I want New Testament. And you can add your own in there. For example, I, you know, you could add Matthew or John or Luke or, or Romans or Romans through Ephesians. I mean, you can do lots of specific studies. I'm not going to show you how to do that, but you can do your own works and find out how to do that. You just basically define the range here. But I'm going to choose New Testament. And then this, now that it's uh, selected as such, I have to actually click in here and hit enter again. And what it's going to do is it's going to bring me 29 times that these phrases are used. Okay. Now here's one time and here's another time. So if you uh, divide that in half, you've got about 14 verses-ish that are being referred to because sometimes the word commandment or the word keep could be used twice in one verse and that's where you'd get 29, which is an odd number, whereas it's only two words and you'd think you'd get an um, even number, but that's why, because one of these words might be used twice in a verse. Anyways, so now I'm going to look at these verses and we're going to see what it is that God is saying to us in the New Testament about keeping the commandments. Is it something that we're not supposed to do, or is it something that we're supposed to do? Let's look. Why do you call me good? We've already gone through that one. We've, uh, we've already seen also what it says in this uh, little section here as well, so I'm not going to deal with that further. Mark 7 verse 9, he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. Okay, wait a minute. So. God's commandments are not the same thing as your own tradition? Right. They're actually quite opposite. Your traditions, unless they are in concert with the commandments of God, are not God's commandments. And I'm just going to say it. There's, you know, the Catholics, for example, they proudly reject the words of God in the Bible because of their tradition. Well, they've got this whole thing on their head. They don't realize that people like me and like yourself, likely, most likely, we want to follow the Bible, not tradition. And if it's in your heart to follow the Bible, then you will say that the Bible matters more than anybody's tradition. It doesn't matter who go, does what, where. We want to follow the Bible because God is the one that gives us instruction, right? That's what I want, and I, I believe that's what you want as well. So, okay, you reject the commandment of God, and Jesus was not saying this in a good context. He was actually saying this, woe unto you, right? You hypocrites. And it's because they're rejecting the commandments of God for their own tradition. Now, Jesus said it very plainly, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, like I had already said, his commandments are the commandments of the Father because Jesus did everything the Father wanted him to do while he was on the earth. Jesus had a God that he served. It's his Father. And when you serve Christ, you are serving the God that he served because that's what Christ was all about. If you love Christ, you're going to do the same thing he did. You're going to keep the Father's commandments, which ended up being Christ's commandments because he never obeyed the commandments of anybody else, even himself. You see, so this, this verse doesn't need to be confusing. This verse is all about the Father. It's because of God's or Christ's love for the Father. Notice as we continue in 15.10 of John, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, even in the same way as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Oh, so now you see the connection there. It's just a few verses later. If you love me, keep my commandments. Because if you love me and keep my commandments, then basically you're doing the, what the Father did for me. Because I'm doing what you know my Father has done. So that's what Jesus is saying here. What about Acts 15.24? This is now in the uh, general conference session, if you will, that they had in the book of Acts with all the apostles and leaders, James, Peter, John, everybody was there. For as much as we have heard that certain, some of them, not all of them, certain which went out from us, they went out from us, have troubled you with words and they were subverting your souls. What does subverting mean? Is that a good thing? They were actually, let's see, uh, they were giving you baggage. They were packing up, or by implication, to upset, to subvert. They were subverting or upsetting your souls, saying, this is what certain of them that went out from us were subverting your souls with. They were saying, you must keep the law of Moses. You must be circumcised. 
and keep the law. Okay, so the it, being circumcised is actually part of keeping the law. Okay, so keeping the law and circumcision is, is kind of the same thing, but they were making it clear that circumcision is, is highly important and you must keep the law. To whom we, as apostles in the early general conference of the apostolic revival that we have seen since that time, they were saying, whom we gave no such commandment. Like, we, we didn't tell anybody to get circumcised and keep the law of Levi. Absolutely not. So here, this one verse is really quite powerful. Anyways, it says in 1 Corinthians seven nineteen, circumcision is nothing, he says, to the different church, not just the general conference, if you will, but the circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But what is something is the keeping of the commandments of God. Wait a minute, I thought circumcision was part of the commandments of God given to Moses. Right, you're right, it is, but that's not what we're talking about. We're giving no such commandment about keeping the ceremonial law and circumcision. But what we are doing is telling people to keep the commandments of God, which was exemplified in the life of Christ, especially, um, you know, in, in that covenant where there were times where he didn't go to the Feast of Tabernacles. He didn't go to, he didn't even keep the Passover the right way. I've got it written out, you know, if you're interested. There's um, this time where Jesus was with the apostles or the disciples in the upper room, and he took his shoes off. But wait a minute, the Old Testament said you're supposed to have your shoes on. He didn't have a rod in his hand. He was l like laying down relaxed instead of being up and ready to go. He, uh, you know, they did have unleavened bread, but there was no lamb. They didn't have a, I mean, he was the lamb and, and they weren't about to eat flesh like actually, but it was symbolic in John chapter six, as we talked about earlier. And so this whole idea of not being ready, not uh, having the various herbs and stuff that was commanded actually in Exodus chapter 12, it was very different in the New Testament. And we can learn from that one experience that it was very different. In John chapter 7, for example, Jesus was not at the fe Feast of Tabernacles. They were like, hey, you should go up and show yourself. The brothers did, kind of mocking him. Um, you know, show yourself at the feast. He's like, no, it's not my time yet. And he went like kind of back through the back door and he came in at a different time. And he wasn't there as at the time that he was expected to be there. Right? You can learn that actually, I think, in the Desire of Ages. It's pretty interesting. So just, you know, we're not to keep the law of circumcision and that law of Levi. We're to keep the commandments of God, as Jesus demonstrated. It says there in chapter 6, verse 14 of First Timothy, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's really important because we are to keep the commandment without spot. Now, it does say this commandment, and you can go and search for yourself what commandments are being referred to by Paul, but I'm pretty sure he says, like, for example, in Romans chapter 7, that the commandment is good and holy, and the law is good and holy and just. And so don't think that he's talking about the law of Levi, which he just condemned over here. Well, actually, he was with the group when they condemned it over here in the uh, general council or the general conference. And here it's the commandments of God. So he is teaching that we're to keep the commandments of God without spot. He's not teaching a different set of commandments to Timothy because he was actually encouraging Timothy in the seminary, if you will, here. He was actually leading him through, you could say, like a, uh, oh, what is it, uh, a session out in the field. He was co-working with him as his leader. And that's kind of like pastoral language, if you will. It says there in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, Hereby we do know that we know him, which is God, if, this is conditional, this is how we know that we know God, if we keep his commandments. And don't tell me that John didn't know what the commandments were. John very well knew what the commandments were. You can go through and find all sorts of uh, keeping of the commandments in the book of John and in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John as well. He's pretty clear, and uh, it is the commandments of God. And so John was one that loved the Lord with all his heart. I mean, think about who better could God have picked through his son to write the book of Revelation? It was John, the one that loved Christ like so much, and he could see in Christ the divine nature that Matthew, Mark, and Luke couldn't even see. Like Luke saw his human nature for sure, and he talked about him as a child, and he went through all this stuff that, you know, a physical human doctor would deal with. But Matthew and Mark, they were dealing with other aspects. Like Mark, Matthew totally understood the kingdom principle. Mark understood like the work principle. He knew that that you know, Christ was a worker, but Luke understood the humanity and John understood the divinity of Christ. And so that's why I think 
God, through his son, chose John to keep him alive on the island of Patmos so that he could write the book of Revelation. It was because this man understood the divinity of Christ far greater than the other apostles. Okay, so uh, John understood the Ten Commandments. I think John was a very dedicated soul. Though, if you read a book called um, Sanctified Life, you realize that John had a pretty rough background. He wasn't that guy that just like came out as a Christian and he lived as a Christian and he was always a Christian. Oh no, he wanted to call fire down on people sometimes. And so you, you know that he was selfish. He was confused sometimes. He was, you know, proud just like everybody else. But John was used of God because he understood who Christ was. And like I said, he knew what the Ten Commandments are referring to. So here, this is how we know that we know him. I mean, like this is a good, you know, standard whereby we can check ourselves if we keep his commandments. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Oh, okay, so in order for God to hear your prayers, you ought to hear his? Is that what it's saying? Oh, yeah. You're like, there, you know, there's a mutual relationship here. You don't just get stuff because you ask. You get stuff because you want a relationship and God will work with you. And that's what's beautiful about 1 John 3.22. What about 1 John 5, 2? By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Wait a minute. It said that we know that we know God if we keep his commandments, but here in the same chapter, or yeah, same book, it's saying we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So, like, loving God helps us to love others as well. So, I mean, think about it. If everybody was truly obedient to God's commandments, not the commandments of the beast in his image. No, 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 no. God's commandments in his holy word. If we were all obedient to those, how much love would there be in the world? It would be amazing. I wouldn't have to worry about you stealing from me or, you know, spending inappropriate time with my wife or coveting or, you know, um, killing me or, or doing all these things. We would all be happy and holy and peaceable and just you know, that, that kind of life that we're looking forward to in heaven. That's what it would be. And I, I really want to be there. So, I mean, I want to just follow God. And he's asked me to do certain things. And that's what I want to do. Not to be a Christian, be, because I am a Christian. God has put within me a heart that wants to serve him. And listen, when God says repent, that's a choice that you make co-working with him. He gives you the gift of repentance. And you're to receive that gift and, and work with it. And so when God says keep the commandments, it's not that you're going to do it by yourself. You co-work with him. He gives you the gift, the power, the strength, the spirit, whereby you can do this, and you co-work with him. The whole gospel is all, all about co-working with God and his son through the ministration of his spirit, which we find given by the ministry of the angels. Anyways, let's, co let's continue. And the next verse here, I'll just read them two together. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Now this word is burdensome, weighty. It's like, oh, I gotta keep the Sabbath. No, it's not about that. It's about like, wow, look at what God has provided for us. It's friends and his word and nature and various things like that. Even time alone with him can be precious on the Sabbath day. A time away from work and, and all those wonderful things. So this is, is really good for like a standard whereby we can check ourselves if we need to. And then these final two verses that we read earlier, that the dragon is wroth with those children that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Let me say it this way. He makes war with the uh, children. He's angry with the woman, but makes war with the children, which of course would mean that he's probably angry with them too. So anyways, I'm just sticking with the words there. So now, what we've done, I'm going to go back to our original section here. We have looked up this idea in Revelation 14, verse 12, which is the final portion of the third angel's message. And we've seen what it means to keep the commandments of God. In the Bible, this phrase, but also the idea of keeping the commandments in the New Testament. Now, I will say that having looked at those in the New Testament and also throughout the Bible, never, 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 never once does it tell us that we should not keep the commandments of God, okay? In fact, Jesus rebuked those that said uh, they were, or rather, that were keeping the tradition of men above the commandments of God. So, when we try to understand what the Bible is saying about the commandments, it is always positive. It's not negative. 
there are preachers today that will say that, no, 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 you can't keep the commandments of God, that's works, it was nailed to the cross, you know, etc. Well, then what you should do is just when the tithe plate comes around, you should pinch a little bit for yourself because stealing was part of the commandments and they were nailed to the cross. And you'll see that brother wake up. So, you know, the point is that they don't even know what they're talking about. They have no idea. And so what we should do is, just like it says in Psalm 119, 115, get away from those people. You know, depart from me, you evildoers. I want to keep the commandments of my God. And be like David, you know, the one that had a heart after God. You know, as it says, he, has, he was a man um, after my own heart, I think is what the Bible says about David. And so we can know that the Bible teaches positively that we should keep the commandments. Why? Because it says, and the faith of Jesus. That's why. That's what we're going to look at next time and try to understand a little bit better what it means to keep the commandments. How do we do this? And then I think that's going to wrap up our three angels' messages concepts. And so anyways, I want to follow God. I truly, truly, with all my heart, want to follow God. And I want you to accept that same um, motive, that same purpose, that same desire as we pray together. And what that means is we're going to study the Bible to find out what he wants us to do. And as we study, God will bless us. He will lead us. He will encourage and direct us. And so I want that for myself. Let's pray together and ask for God's blessings in our behalf. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you for giving us this time whereby we can study a little bit about what the Bible says in the phrase, keep the commandments of God, and also um, just looking at the idea of the commands that you have given and how You've been positive in our behalf in regard to those commandments. You've not told us negatively, don't keep God's commandments. And so help us to see this and understand that your Bible is giving us direction, your words. And we want you to be our God, so we want to honor your words. And we want to be able to be blessed as a result. Thank you so much for co-working with us and allowing us to co-work with you. We pray that you would continue to lead our steps. We want to walk in your path. We want to be blessed and we want others to follow the example that we'll, we'll not only give them visually, but we will also teach them. Open our lips and help us to be very courageous in educating and teaching and showing, not just uh, passive necessarily. We pray that you would guide and keep us, that uh, our steps would be uh, a glory to your name. This is really our desire. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.